Chapter 10, Ethics of IT Organizations, Part 1, Non-Traditional IT Workers. The learning outcomes include, list and describe the reasons for using non-traditional workers, analyze advantages and disadvantages of using in-house talent as opposed to non-traditional IS workers, Evaluate the ethical challenges of using non-traditional IS workers. Summarize the key steps to complete when using H-1B visas for highly qualified individuals. Describe the advantages and disadvantages of outsourcing IT projects. Let's start by looking at the importance of the IT workers in an organization. Managers must use care to align the IT strategy with the business strategy and not the other way around. As an IT manager, it's important to understand and apply sound project management techniques, whether you use Agile, Scrum, or the standard project management body of knowledge. Why is this so important? IT projects are notorious for being late over budget and having lower functionality than promised. The percent of failed IT projects varies, but McKinsey reports large IT projects run 45% over budget and 7% over time, while delivering 56% less value than predicted. It's an enterprise-wide technology implementation, and this can have disastrous effects for the organization. If you need more IT people, you have to find them wherever you can traditional or non-traditional. It can mean important differences for your organization. Further, Computer Weekly says that 60% of big data projects, that's the current buzzword of choice, don't even make it beyond pilot and experimental phases. That's tremendous potential that isn't being achieved. When business intelligence projects do move forward, 70 to 80 percent of them fail. Imagine having that rate of failure at most any job. Most of us would be looking for a new job. Even weather forecasters, like my husband, get it right about half the time. But IT projects present a unique set of interdisciplinary parts that need to work together to allow the project to run smoothly. In fact, Poor communication is often the cause of those 70 to 80 percent of business intelligence projects that fail. Beyond enterprise-wide IT systems, mobile apps are a burgeoning field that presents other opportunities for organizations to get close to their customers. If a company doesn't have a good mobile app, I simply choose someone else. With the development of mobile apps, new trends have emerged for business. IT is becoming decentralized. That is, people are doing their own thing without even talking to the IT group. In fact, 61% of businesses admitted that they had created a mobile app, often multiple apps, without any IT involvement or approval. They didn't want to face the long timeline for IT projects and the poor success rates. So they would very quickly develop their own app. 81% of businesses are comfortable with doing that. It does change the role of IT and the CEO and CIO of the organization who aren't involved and don't even know about these IT projects, which are being marketed under, under their name. Organizations are struggling with these issues, and as IT managers and users, we have to think about how to handle these situations. So what's it mean in terms of ethics? When using non-traditional workers, you have to think through the issues. You want to offer a fair wage and a safe working environment while delivering efficient and effective services to your organization. As the number of temporary workers continues to increase, these issues will be even more important. We know that organizations don't complete IT projects well. And we know that we need non-traditional workers to help us accomplish our goals. In fact, more than 50% of jobs created in December 2013, for instance, were temporary roles. But why non-traditional workers and not traditional? One reason 
is the shortage of trained and experienced IT workers with the skills needed by Google and Microsoft and Amazon and others in Silicon Valley. They see much of the doctoral seeking students completing education here in the U.S. and then going back home. As fewer Americans obtain doctoral degrees, particularly in STEM-related fields, the needs of these organizations will continue to increase. We may choose to select contingent workers, those that we hire temporarily, either part-time or full-time, as the need arises. Some workers may be H-1B visa seekers, those who are non-native-born U.S. citizens. Or a company may simply decide to locate the business elsewhere and use workers in that country. Regardless, the need for non-traditional workers is only increasing. Let's define contingent worker as a job situation where someone doesn't have expectations for long-term employment. They may be hired to complete a project or during critical changes in supply and demand. They may be independent contractors who work at an hourly rate in a part-time and or temporary role. Or you may call in extra workers as needed depending on the day of the project or the situation. Or you may contract with a temporary company to provide you with the type of temporary workers that you may need. As this chart shows, the demand for temporary workers has increased over the years, but there are dips and peaks in demand. These changes also often follow times of contraction or growth of the economy. When should we use contingent workers? If we have a project that needs to be completed and it can be completed quickly and inexpensively, and you don't have trained in-house staff to complete the project, then it's a good idea to ha hire someone to help temporarily. If a project requires skills that you don't need in your company later, then hire someone with the skills. You should ensure that these workers don't have access to valuable competitive information or trade secrets or other key information. You have little commitment to the employees and the employees have little commitment to the organization. Even with temporary or contingent workers, the government may decide that you must pay payroll taxes and benefits if the temporary worker is more of a permanent employee. There are complex employment rules that determine if someone is a permanent employee or temporary employee. If the temporary employee comes into the same place and performs the same task as the person who sits next to them who is a permanent employee, then they may be permanent, no matter what you call them or what contracts they sign. The deciding factor is the degree of control that a company exercises over them their work location, their work times, the specific duties they complete, etc. Let's look a little closer at the H-1B visa program. It's a temporary work visa issued by the USCIS, but only for those who work in specialty occupations, including technology. These people may work for a maximus, maximum continuous period of five years, and then at that time, with sponsorship from their employer, they can apply for permanent residence. When there's a heavy reliance on H-1B visas, it indicates that there aren't enough IT employees to meet the demands. But Silicon Valley argues that there aren't enough well-trained U.S. citizens who want to work in the IT field with the hours required and at the salary offered. Regardless, it's a problem that Silicon Valley wishes would change. Many argue that the H-1B visa program adversely affects the wages of American IT workers. However, I've gone through the H-1B visa process with several of our faculty members. It's a huge commitment and requires completing a tedious set of papers, posting announcements, and following through with all of the steps. We don't hire someone unless we plan to commit for six years and then sponsor. When we evaluate applicants, we ignore nationality and citizenship status, and we select those who are most qualified. If the person we hire is a U.S. citizen, fine. If not, we're willing to go through the paperwork process to get the highly talented person. When I first started chairing recruiting committees many years ago, our chair at the time said we shouldn't consider non-U.S. citizens because of the H-1B hassle. The co-chair of the committee and I followed those guidelines for two years. 
Before we began reviewing the third year, however, the co-chair and I went and told our chair that we were excluding three-fourths of our qualified applicants because they weren't U.S. citizens. It's not illegal to exclude non-citizens since there's extra work required to hire them. And as non-citizens, they are not eligible for the same rights and protections that are guaranteed to U.S. citizens. After we made the case to our chair, he agreed, and we never excluded non-citizens again. My view is that we should cast a wide net to ensure that people from all different types of places and, and backgrounds, age, race, sex, religion, etc., then we select the most qualified person or people and invite them for a phone interview and later, if it works out, a campus visit and an offer. Like other STEM-related fields, the people currently earning PhDs and IS are often from other countries. We try to get the most qualified person who is a good match for our needs. You may want to take a look at these two videos, one where Google exec Eric Schmidt makes his feelings about the H-1B visa program clearly known. The other YouTube video gives a short introduction to the H-1B program. Here you see the detailed steps that are required to get an H-1B visa, visa, including input from the prospective employer, the worker seeking the visa, the Departments of Labor, Homeland Security, State, and USCIS. It's not for the faint of heart. Only those potential employees with a job offer and a willing sponsor are, a, are eligible to apply for an H-1B visa. As a first step, the Department of Labor ensures that minimum criteria are met. For some jobs, that means, was there any U.S. citizen who met the minimum qualifications stated in the job announcement? Obviously, you must be very careful and clear when writing job descriptions. With our field, which requires a Ph.D. in I.S., we are allowed to argue that we chose the most qualified job applicant. You have to make an argument, but that requirement makes it easier for us to get the best professors here at KSU. You can see in the graphics some history of the H-1B visa. From 2000 to 2004 or so, companies were allowed to hire up to almost 200,000 workers under the H-1B program. In 2004, that number dramatically reduced to about 65,000. Since 2006, after loud protests by IT leaders in the U.S., that number was allowed to include an additional 20,000 non-U.S. citizens who were graduates from U.S. universities. At the bottom of the graphic, you see the years where applications were still available at the end of the year. In recent years, the 65 to 85,000 cap fills completely often in the first few days or weeks of the new year being made available. Companies have to try to game the system to make sure they get the, their selected prospective employees included in the program. The IT skills shortage and the positions that remain unfilled in IT are in some part created as a result of the reduction of H-1B visas. So you, as graduate-seeking students with an interest in ISIT, are well-positioned to write your own future. If you thought you'd never have to deal with any legal documents beyond the occasional click wrap agreement, you are wrong. If you work in IT, you will likely be involved in requests for proposal and or requests for quotations, the government version. Outsourcing requires that you know a little bit about contracts and legal requirements. Outsourcing is a long-term business arrangement where a company partners with an external organization that has expertise where needed. A company may choose rural insourcing where they try to find lower cost areas with a pool of well-educated talent nearby to save money. Or companies may go all the way outside the country selecting offshore outsourcing. Companies choose to do this to save money, to find the right, the skills they need, or to find a business environment that has expertise and ability to ramp up during growth periods. Some of the goals of offshore outsourcing include reducing cost, reducing the constraints that would be placed upon your own employees if they had to do the tasks, access to a pool of qualified labor, reduce turnaround times, and allowing your employees to focus on the core business and strategic issues. 
Companies often outsource business process outsourcing, but they rarely outsource strategy planning or even project management. Of course, there are limitations to offshore outsourcing, and you must not go into an arrangement thinking it will be easy or a way to save a lot of money quickly. For instance, your company may not realize the actual savings that were anticipated. Issues such as cultural differences, language difficulties, shipping delays, and so forth can limit some of the anticipated benefits. Here's where your contract skills, at least as it relates to understanding your portion of the project, come into play. Plan, plan, and plan some more before embarking on an off offshore outsourcing adventure. Firms also incur costs simply to find the offshoring partner. There's a selection process, and you don't know how the partner will work, work out over the long term. You may receive negative publicity if layoffs happen in the U.S. portion of your company while you're expanding offshore outsourcing. As mentioned, the culture language difference should not be minimized. Make sure there's a project manager on the other side of the relationship who speaks English. There's a risk that information security protections are poorer in other countries, which may bring risk to your customers. If data is compromised, you have to find a way to win back your customers' trust. Of course, offshoring increases U.S. reliance on foreign talent to build the IT infrastructure of the future. Ideally, you'd like to have people within your organization to work with the business strategy plans and develop a supporting IT infrastructure. You don't want to rely on a faraway partner to prepare you for the future. There are strategies you may use to improve your chances of success. For instance, you should make sure that the project manager in the U.S. company has a required expertise in the technologies that are being used offshore. As mentioned, you want a project manager overseas who speaks the employer company's native language, and you require a pool of staff large enough to meet your needs. India, for instance, an IT outsourcing destination of choice, completely changed its educational system to accommodate the increased need for IT workers. As a result, India has a flourishing middle class now and a technically well-trained workforce that appeals to potential outsourcing partners. You need to make sure that the country where you will partner has the infrastructure to meet your needs. It doesn't help to have the availability of a highly skilled workforce with an infrastructure that can't support your needs. Similarly, you should only outsource with companies who have a stable government. You don't want to build an excellent IT partner and then have the government nationalize the company. Finally, you need high-quality on-site managers and supervisors. You need reliable, well-trained personnel who are well-versed in the cultural nuances of the outsourcing partner. By using these strategies, you will increase the chances of success and minimize the potential for devastating losses. To summarize, IT projects are important to a company's success. As an IT manager or C-level executive, you have to find talented, dependable people to meet the needs of your organization. In IT particularly, you may have to decide whether to use in-house talent, hire people to complete the projects you have on a temporary contract basis, or go with rural insourcing or offshore outsourcing. Each choice has limitations and there are strategies you can use to improve the chances of success. For highly qualified, scarce employees, you may consider H-1B visas, but these visas are difficult to obtain, highly competitive, and limited. Outsourcing offers significant opportunities for saving costs and delivering value to your customers, but you have to carefully evaluate the true cost and savings before making a decision. You also need to know a little bit about contracts, even as an IT employee. By planning in advance and accurately predicting cost and savings, you position your organization to achieve successful outcomes.